Welcome back, my fellow seekers. Looks like a lot of you wanted to hear about the connection between ancient Egypt and China. So here's an interesting article I found by theforeignpolicy.com. It seeks to ask the question of, does ancient Chinese civilization come from Egypt? The article goes on to say, on a cool Sunday evening in March of 2016, a geochemist named Sun Huidong gave a public lecture to an audience of laymen, students, and professors of the University of Science and Technology in Hufei the capital city of the landlocked province of Anhua in eastern China. But the professor didn't just talk about geochemistry, he also cited several ancient Chinese classics at one point quoting his historian Sima Qian's description of the topography of the Xia Empire, traditionally regarded as China's founding dynasty dating over 2000 BC. Northwards the stream is divided and becomes into nine rivers, wrote Sima Qian in his first century historiographic the records of the great historian. Reunited, it forms the opposite river and flows into the sea. In other words, the stream in question wasn't China's famed Yellow River, which flows from west to east. There's one other major river in the world which flows northward. Which one is it? The professor asked. The Nile, someone replied. Sun then showed a map of the famed Egyptian river and its delta, with nine of its distributaries flowing into the Mediterranean. This author, a research at the same institute, watched as the audience members broke into smiles and murmurs, intrigued that these ancient Chinese texts seemed to better agree with the geography of Egypt than that of China. In the past year, Sun, a highly decorated scientist, has ignited a passionate online debate with claims that the founders of Chinese civilization were not any sense Chinese, but actually migrants from Egypt. He conceived this connection in the 1990s while performing radiometric dating of ancient Chinese bronze. To his surprise, their chemical composition more closely resembled those of ancient Egyptian bronze than native Chinese ore. Both Sun's ideas and the controversy surrounding them flow out of much older tradition of nationalist archaeology in China, which for more than a century has sought to answer the basic scientific question that has always been heavily politicized. Where did the Chinese people come from? Sun argues that the Chinese bronze technology, widely thought by scholars to have first entered through the northwest of the country through the prehistoric Silk Road, actually came from the sea, he argues. According to him, its bearers were the Hyksos, the Western Asian people who ruled part of northern Egypt as foreigners between the 17th and 16th century BC. Some have argued this is the group that the Jews broke off, and possibly the Phoenicians and other groups, until their eventual expulsion. He notes that the Hyksos possessed at an early date almost all the same remarkable technologies, bronze, metallurgy, chariots, literacy, and domesticated plants and animals that archaeologists discovered at the early cities of Yin, the capital of China's second dynasty, the Xiang, between 13 and 1046 BC. Since the Hyksos are known to have developed ships for war and trade, they enabled them to sail in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Sun speculates that a small population escaped their collapsing dynasty using seafaring technology that eventually brought them their Bronze Age tech culture to the coast of China. Anticipating his critics, Sun wrote online that to explain the new origins of Chinese civilization may appear ridiculous in the eyes of some because historians long ago have stated we are the children of the Yan and Yellow Emperor. Although Yellow Emperor is a little vague to understanding if this is referring to race or is this referring to gold for the Egyptians were known to have covered their sarcophagus in gold. So Sima Qian kind of correlated this. Historian Sima Qian took these legendary figures as the progenitors of the Han Chinese and the Yellow Emperor's great-grandson, Yu the Great, and the founder of the semi-mythical Xia dynasty. These served as the origin stories of the imperial China and continued to be credited for decades after the Republic replaced it in 1912. So that even in the nation's most iconic classic and rebellious sons, Sun Tzu said and Chiang Kai-shek and the People's Republic founder of Mao, Mao Zedong, among them, all give a little credit to the Yellow Emperor's tomb. Even now, often repeat claim that the Chinese civilization is approximately 5,000 years old takes as its starting point to suppose the reign of this legendary emperor. It's also possible that the legend in Japan of Emperor Jimmu may actually derive from this. Emperor Jimmu was supposedly the legendary emperor who founded Japan around 660 BC 
According to Japanese mythology, he is descended from the sun goddess Amaterasu. I might point out the word Amaterasu has a similar linguistic connection with Amun-Ra, which is the Egyptian sun god deity or symbol. But it really was anti-Qing intellectuals who began to examine critically the roots of Chinese civilization and from the first time seized the idea that laid in the West. The work that most captured their imagination was that of the French philologist Albert Turin de la Capire, I'm not sure how you say that, but in 1892 he published the work of Western Origins of Early Chinese Civilization from 2300 BC to 200 AD, and then translated into Chinese in 1903. It compared the hexagrams of the Book of Changes with the cuneiform of Mesopotamia and proposed that Chinese civilization originated in Babylon. The Yellow Emperor was identified as King Nakante, who supposedly led the people out of the Middle East and into the central plains of the Yellow River Valley around 2300 BC. Liu Shipei, the Peking University history professor and true author behind the pseudonymous chronology of the Yellow Emperor, was among the first to promote Sino-Babylonianism in books such as the 1903 History of the Chinese Nation. By 1915, the theory was widespread enough that the National Anthem of the Republic, commissioned by President Yuan Shikai, referred to it as obliquely calling China the famous descendants from the Kunlan Peak, which Chinese mythology locates as the far, far west. Another endorsement came from the Sun Yat-sen, founder of the Republic of China, who stated in his 1923 The Three Principles of People's Lectures that growth of Chinese civilization may be explained by the fact that settlers who migrated from another place to this valley already possessed a high civilization. To these and other revolutionaries, Sino-Babylonianism was not only the latest European scientific opinion, it was hoped that since China shared some ancestry as other civilizations, there was no ultimate reason why it could not catch up with more advanced nations like in Europe and America. Sino-Babylonianism fell out of favor in China during the 1920s when Japanese aggression escalated and different nationalist politics took over. The discovery of Neolithic pottery in Longshang and Shangdong in 1928 showed that eastern China had been inhabited by indigenous groups before the Bronze Age migration. In the same year, excavation of the city of Yin began. By account of excellence of the Yin Shang material culture, its famous oracle bones, whose writing is the ancestor of modern Chinese script used today. So it's pretty clear that indigenous culture already existed way before the Bronze Age. But before that, it's unsure of if some migration may have happened. So clearly this idea had political motivations during the colonial periods, but it's still possible that there is some connection with Egypt, but it probably has to go back at least 3000 BC, but also in the later periods there was probably some cross-pollination happening from the Persians. This may explain how the lodestone got over to China, which is used for compasses. Also the similar ritual burial practices found in Xia could hint to us that these traditions were passed down from the Middle East to China over thousands of years. Also the megalithic architecture found in Japan's Kofuns and the dolmens in Korea seemed to be hinting of a megalithic cultural tradition of construction techniques that was also passed down, possibly coming from the sea. Only a few cultures in the world actually had megalithic architectural styles, so it's kind of interesting to see that this was also found in East Asia. I think this tradition was passed down from the Middle East to East Asia through explorers from the sea and the land, through the Silk Roads. But I think in most cases on the Silk Road it would have been a one-way trip, so they assimilated with the native Han, making it almost indistinguishable of the original culture that may have passed down these traditions. For the landscape shapes people's cultures, such as the possible Chinese version of the Great Flood. Now floods happen a lot on rivers, so logically it's natural that other cultures would have it. But it's not necessarily true. In 1920 BC, the Yellow River had a major landslide rupture causing flooding on the Yellow River. But the date I don't think is going back far enough, accounting for the legend of Yu, the great engineer who tried to control the floods of China. This legend goes back over 2100 BC. This could simply be the date that the legend was introduced into China and fitted to the Yellow River and their land doesn't mean that this is the original source. Now clearly the Chinese flood myth has overly allegorical symbology, making it very hard to understand. It's almost like a riddle. The only correlation you can make is that Yu was like an engineer, and Noah was also an engineer when it came to making a boat, but Yu was like an engineer when it came to controlling the rivers. So there is a clear difference. 
but after 3,000 years or more, the story could be completely changed to fit to new lands. But the similar burial mound practices and the megalithic tombs found in them, I think could point to a similar culture that has been passed down to China. The engineering and architectural knowledge I think was passed down to China instead of being invented solely by the Han Chinese, although they greatly built upon that knowledge and advanced it even more. They improved upon it. I think the legend of Shambhala is where this knowledge from master to apprentice was passed down to China, from Persia, and possibly from the sea as well. And I believe the legend of Shambhala, or Agartha, came from the Garden of Eden, that is Egypt's Nile Delta. As I explained in my other Biblical Enigma videos, there may have been three exoduses out of the Garden of Egypt. One over 12,000 BC during the Younger Dryas Impact Theory event, another over 8,000 years ago during the 8,200 year cooling period. What we might call the destruction of the cities of the plain of the Nile Delta by fire, which could have been the final blow of the lost city-state of Egypt, which I argue could be the real Atlantis under modern-day Cairo. And the final exodus was during Moses' time, which could have been partially caused by the eruption of Thera over 1600 BC. I think the Chinese origins could trace themselves to one of these three events, or all three of them. We just don't know because the influx of migration patterns tends to spike during catastrophes. But most likely it was just a small number who got all the way over to China and integrated with the native Han hunter and gather tribes. So most of the culture of China was grown from its own land, so it is truly Chinese. But certain traditions were adopted, and clues are in the pyramidal mounds in the megaliths of East Asia. What do you think about this idea? In my next video, I'll be focusing more on metaphysical enigmas. This has been Enigma Seeker, keep seeking those enigmas. Enigma de Bravature.